energy and air pollution will be one of the top five issues for the general election. We talk about Putin being in control. He's not really. It's the various factions under him and it suits them to have him at the front. If you're trying to save for a house deposit and you'd have to save up some crazy amount of money, how on earth are you going to do that if a pint is seven pounds? There's certain key things that we want from India and there's certain key things that they want from us. You're listening to Bloomberg UK Politics. I'm Ewan Potts. And I'm Caroline Hepke. Welcome to the programme. News this morning then, (laughs) the battle to own one of Britain's most influential newspapers. Well, I say that at least in recent years, and it's a judgment call. This is, of course, The Telegraph. It's thrown up an interesting name, and I think one worth talking about. So there are reports in various other newspapers here in the UK that the American billionaire Ken Griffin, who founded the hedge fund Citadel, is talking to a consortium of investors about providing some financial backing to buy The Telegraph Media Group. Yeah, if he does sign up, Bloomberg understands will be investing his personal wealth rather than through his companies. But he is a big character Mm. in the world of finance. He's a major Republican donor, although he doesn't support uh, Donald Trump. And his fortune exceeds $36 billion. So he certainly has the cash. Also interesting is that the consortium that he's talking to is led by another hedge fund manager, Paul Marshall, who is a joint owner of GB News. Yeah. um, Remember, Griffin is one of the Wall Street leaders and he was in the newspapers quite recently um, because he was one of those who met with the Ukrainian president, Vladimir Zelensky, on the sidelines of the UN, You're talking about you know trying to uh, get financing basically to rebuild Ukraine. So you know he's he's a well known figure. And why is the Telegraph sale happening now? I think that's also quite interesting. Lloyd's Banking Group putting it up for sale. Um, it took ownership, if you remember, after the uh, the dispute around the loans with the previous owners, the Barclays family. Again, very well known financiers, and the bank is trying to sell the newspaper ahead of the next elections. Yeah, it's interesting. These sales really come up very rarely. I was trying to think mm. when the last newspaper sale was, and it must be absolutely uh, years ago. They're, they're, they, they come around rarely. And although people talk about the declining influence of the newspapers, of course, there is the, all the online presence. So they do still hold a fair bit of sway. Yeah. Well, speaking of getting your message across, it's party conference season. So it's the final day of the first party conference of the season. Ed Davey will wrap up the Lib Dems gathering in Bournemouth with a speech focused on tackling problems in the NHS. He'll say his party is poised to tear down the Conservatives' blue wall seats. Well, joining us now from Bournemouth is the deputy leader of the Liberal Democrats, Daisy Cooper. Daisy, Thanks so much for joining us on Bloomberg UK Politics. What is the Liberal Democrats' mission? Well, the Liberal Democrats have set out uh, our priorities. Uh, Between now and the general election, we will be setting out our plans as to how we are going to solve the crisis in our NHS, how we're going to tackle the cost of living and how uh, we're going to protect the environment. These are the three top issues that I think many people around the country are incredibly worried about. And the Liberal Democrats have been leading the way in setting out plans as to how we can achieve all three. Daisy, how many seats are you targeting? The Lib Dems currently have 15. What are you looking to gain in the next general election? Well, across the country, the Liberal Democrats are in second position to the Conservatives in around 80 seats. um, And we are hoping to win as many of those as possible. If Keir Starmer falls short at the election, is there any appetite for coalition in your party? Well, the Liberal Democrats have ruled out doing any deal whatsoever with the Conservatives because their record speaks for itself. You know, people around the country are struggling to see a GP, they're struggling to see a dentist, they're struggling to pay their energy bills and their food bills, and people are sick to the back teeth of being taken for granted by this Conservative government, which is why we've ruled out doing any deal whatsoever with them. Um, But in terms of the next general election, our only goal is to get as many Liberal Democrat MPs elected as possible. And Ed Davey and I have said that our goal is to focus on 10 p.m. on polling day and to get as many seats as possible over the line. Lib Dem conference is a a policy making machine, isn't it? You've got reams of policy in the Lib Dems. What's the point of it all if you're not going to enter government again? Well, with every, uh, with every, single, uh, every single Liberal Democrat MP uh, adds to our campaigning force in Parliament. So when people elect a Liberal Democrat MP, they get two things. They get uh, a hardworking local champion who will give them a strong voice in their own constituency. But they also add to our campaigning force in Parliament. And the more Liberal Democrat MPs that we can get elected, the more MPs there will be to hold uh, the future, any future government to account over their actions to solve the crisis in our NHS and care services, uh, tackling the cost of living crisis and protecting our environment. 
Now, when it comes to policies in particular that are of interest, conference defeated the leadership's plan to scale back ambitious house building targets. Do you think that your voters in St Albans and in other blue wall seats will actually be happy to take their share of the target that you've got, which is 400,000 new homes being built every single year? Well, I've always been concerned that having a big target will be conflated with the top-down planning system uh, that we currently have under the Conservatives. But yesterday, when we adopted a new policy, what the Liberal Democrats said was that any new housing targets would start at the community level and would start by being bottom-up rather than top-down. So we have rejected the idea of the top-down Westminster system where Westminster dictates housing targets to local authorities. And we're going to replace that with a new system where you first of all look at the need, the housing need in your local community, uh, solving the issues um, around overcrowding by building the social homes and council homes that we need, and then looking at the constraints and the needs of the local area to build up those housing numbers from the bottom up. That, I think, is the right way to do it. Under our system, local authorities and communities would have far more powers to hold developers to account, to force them to build where they've been given permission for local authorities to buy up land, which developers are sitting on in the hope of making more money, um, and giving communities a real say in making sure that we get the right homes in the right places and, crucially, with the right kind of infrastructure. And do you really think that local people and local authorities will take part in that? 400,000 new homes every year. Do you think there's an appetite for that in the southeast of England? Yes, absolutely. I think there's lots of evidence that shows that when local communities are involved in these discussions and they're given real agency and a real voice over um, working out what kind of houses they want, where they want them to be and what infrastructure they want to be there, actually that can lead to a lot of community buy-in into getting these new developments. But really what people are frustrated about is that under this top-down system that we have under the Conservatives, where targets are simply issued by diktat to local authorities, it puts all the power in the hands of developers to choose the land they want to build on, to build the kind of homes that maximise their profits, and to negotiate down any kind of infrastructure that they need to pay for. Under our system, we would flip it on its head so communities have a real say and a real voice in getting the right houses in the right place with the right kind of infrastructure. So you don't think there's actual opposition to building houses in the South East if you change the system? I think there is, if you change the system, I think there is an opportunity to get a lot more buy-in to getting the right houses. I think what people get really frustrated about is that often these top-down housing targets from Westminster simply dictate the number of houses without saying what kind of a house it should be or where it should be or what kind of infrastructure that it should come with. And actually, I think what you find is there's a lot of people who recognise that they need housing in their area because they've got children, they might have um, elderly parents, that they want to live uh, nearby and close to them. So I think people know that there needs to be some kind of housing, but they want a say over what kind of housing it is, where it should go, and how you bring the infrastructure with it. So you get the teachers, the doctors, uh, the roads that you need to make sure that the local area can cope with the new infrastructure. Okay, so putting your faith then in in, uh, local people... um, in order to reach the building target. Um, Let's move on and talk about the EU, though. Your party membership are united in wanting closer ties to the European Union. Polls suggest actually a significant proportion of the electorate agree with that. Why are the Lib Dems not being bolder on Europe? Well, I think we are being pretty bold. What we've said is that we think that Brexit has been a really negative thing for the country. Uh, We know that lots of small businesses have been wrapped up in red tape. We know that many businesses, large and small, can't get the staff and the skills that they need. Uh, We know that farmers, for example, in Britain have been completely sold down the river by the trade deals that the Conservative government has signed, which really undermine our food standards in this country. Um, So what we're doing is we're the only party in the UK that has set out a roadmap for rebuilding UK-EU relations. And that starts by rebuilding the trust that has been so sorely broken. So we're very proud to have that roadmap. I believe we have a moral responsibility to, um, uh, to set out a path for improving those relations between the UK and the EU. But there is a question of emphasis because I am acutely aware from my surgeries and from my inbox and from my door knocking that right now what people are worried about is whether or not they can see a GP, whether they can get their um, treatment in hospital on time, uh, whether they can actually afford bills at the end of the month. And that's why the Liberal Democrats are saying, as we go into the next general election, we will have an utterly ruthless focus, a relentless focus on our plans for fixing the NHS, 
for solving the cost of living crisis and protecting our local environment. So no route map to rejoining the single market or the European Union? Well, we have a roadmap to rebuild relations between the UK and the EU. Uh, as part of that roadmap, there is a four-stage plan. Uh, and at the start of the roadmap, there are things that could be done straight away, things that could happen very, very quickly uh, by any government if they wanted to rebuild that relationship. And that includes things like rejoining uh, Erasmus+, Plus, uh, and other sort of uh, pan-European schemes that would be good for Britain. Uh, but longer term, there are other things that we want to do. And at some point in the future... Our plan is that we would rejoin the single market and the customs union, but that is some way off in the future. The challenge we have right now is rebuilding that trust, rejoining some of these individual programmes that would be good for Britain and making sure that we can show people that there is a roadmap to rebuilding uh, that mm. relationship. But also it's important that we take the British public with us. Do you think that the electorate is ready for change? The unpopularity of the Sunak government is evident in the polls, but do you detect, you know, all the parties, are, including yours, laying out their roadmap to the next general election, do you think actually that it is going to be a, a, a big vote of change or a, an election that is at a moment of significant change in the UK? Well, that decision will really be for the voters, but I really hope that it is. Um, I think many oh, people feel... What, as what is your sense... But- Daisy, what is your sense, though, of the mood in the nation? My sense is that people are really ground down right now. Everything feels hard. People say to me they feel as though everything is broken. Um, And the worst thing is that sometimes people say, you know what, things are so broken, they're not sure if anybody can fix it. And that's why I think that we as Liberal Democrats do have a moral responsibility to speak out and say, you know what, things are bad right now, but we can fix them. And that's why we've been setting out our bold plans on how to fix the NHS, um, you know, on how to tackle the cost of living crisis. And I hope that as we go into the general election, I hope people are able to lift their eyes from their daily struggles, which really are very profound at the moment here in the UK. And they can actually see there is a way forward, there is a brighter future, and that if they decide to choose it, change can come. The 20th of July was a great day for the Liberal Democrats. You won the Summerton of Freem by-election. It was also a good day for Labour. They won the Selby by-election. Is it time to encourage voters uh, to vote tactically uh, and to have some sort of pact uh, to, to, to fight the Tories between your two parties? There have never been any pacts between the Liberal Democrats or any other parties. Uh, there won't be any pacts. And, and the reason for that is we just don't need them. The fact of the matter is that the Liberal Democrats are in second place to the Conservatives in around 80 seats around the country. Um, And we are focusing our efforts on beating as many Conservative MPs as possible. Arguably the most powerful former UK politician in the world right now is Nick Clegg. He's President of Global Affairs at Meta. What does that mean for the Liberal Democrats? Well, um, today is the day that our current party leader, Ed Davey, is giving his speech. Um, Ed Ed Davey uh, is setting out uh, another bold pledge today uh, on health and um, and I hope that many people around the country will listen to Ed's speech and that it will resonate with them. Mm. The fact is that there are many um, uh, former party leaders who still play an active role in public life uh, and some of them within the Liberal Democrats as well. Um, But we are a party that's always listening to the future um, and uh, I'm very excited about the campaign to come. OK, in, in our world and the audience that we speak to in business, finance, economics and obviously uh, in the US often too, they know Nick Clegg and, and we see him in his current role. He's Britain's most influential politician on, on a global stage. He's the voice of big tech and he's immensely well known. Do you not think that that has any implications for your party? Yes, well, we've got a number of former uh, party leaders, including Nick Clegg, who have gone on to play a very important role uh, in public life. Um, I hope very much that uh, Nick will use his platform uh, to speak up for the priorities that the Liberal Democrats have set out under our current leader, Ed Davey. Um, I'm, you know, many businesses around the world, um, you know, be looking at the UK right now and scratching their heads because the current Conservative government have taken some very anti-business decisions, just two in the last week, um, you know, throwing uncertainty into the market, scaring off investors. Um, and as a Liberal Democrat party, we are the natural party of business. Um, and we want to make sure that um, uh, businesses here in the UK know that there is an opportunity for a brighter future and a stronger economy. Um, and we also want businesses around the world to realise that there is a chance for us to put our economy back on track. So um, Nick and others... 
uh, who have a public profile, I hope very much will get behind the Liberal Democrats and our plan and show that we're a party that, uh, you know, whilst we might be ashamed of the current government, we're incredibly proud of our country, we're incredibly proud of our NHS, we're incredibly proud of British business. Daisy, just one final question. I'm curious to know what you sang at Glee Club. <laughs> Uh, do you know what? I didn't make Glee Club this year because I had to get up at five o'clock this morning. But when I was getting up, I saw a couple of people heading home. <laughs> oh, no, not a songstress. Oh, dear, that's a shame. <laughs> Daisy not Cooper, this year. <laughs> thank you so much for being with us. It's been very interesting to have you on, of course, from Bournemouth, the deputy leader of the Liberal Democrats, Daisy Cooper. Well, the UK signs a trade pact with Washington today, but it's not the US administration in Washington. It's with the American state of Washington. It's the sixth trade deal done with a US state and combined the GDP, all all of those six, adds up to more than two trillion pounds. But that still leaves Britain without its long promised trade deal with the whole country. And that leaves an absence of 19 trillion pounds. Well, Industry Minister Nus Ghani is behind the latest deal and she's been speaking to our reporter, Ellen Milligan. Um, I'm here in Seattle to sign the the sixth um, UK-US MOU with Washington State. And this one has a particular focus on um, industries that fall uh, within my brief back home, aviation in in particular. So we're looking at uh, technology, digital technology too, of course, supply chains that takes care of supply chains back home. Um, clean energy, um, I've spoken about aerospace already, clusters and workforce development, um, life sciences, which is, uh, there's a fantastic crossover here, and innovation. We've got about 34 firms, 70, I think, UK uh, sort of business people behind those firms traveling out with us. And to, in the simplest sense, the, the MOU is, is you know, a fantastic framework just to enable business both way to become easier, more efficient, and then quicker um, as well. And this morning with all the, the, uh, the American businesses, they were talking, we were talking about how we remove more barriers to business, for example, how we encourage more collaboration. The Americans are keen to work with us. They get a huge enthusiasm for the work that we're doing in those industries when it comes to technology uh, in particular. And the UK firms we're traveling out with, if they're not already working here, want to be doing much more work. And, and that's why us being here is, is, is working incredibly well for them. Over £2 trillion, pounds, that's the equivalent of the GDP in France. And the reason I love saying that is because two weeks ago, I was so pl- pleased with my advanced manufacturing sector back home because we leapfrogged the French to become the eighth largest uh, manufacturing um, place or country in the world. So a huge amount for us to export, a huge amount of business-to-business work to be done and, you know, uh, MOUs are a fantastic stepping stone, but of course we're here to talk to business mm-hmm. so they can pick up the MOU uh, and be able to work with each other. And would you say this is the most significant MOU with a US state that you've done so far? I think that curiously, each of the MOUs are distinct to the states um, that they work with. I'm incredibly excited about um, being in Seattle because of the, the aviation um, segment to this. Um, within my brief, I know how much work we're doing in aviation when it comes to digitalization, to technology, looking at clean fuel, something called SAF, sustainable aviation fuel, for example. And we're in the UK, we're, we're leading with our R&D work through our um, aviation um, technology institute. So they know we've got a huge amount of R&D. Uh, so for me, I'm very excited about this one in particular because I can see... Um, yeah. how we can make those relationships even You talk in the press release about aerospace being a priority, as you just said, which seeks to facilitate more deals between the UK and Washington State. What what kind of deals are you talking about? M&A or more direct investment? It can be, it can be both, but it's also that this morning when we were talking to American businesses, they want to be involved in sort of um, sharing intelligence and putting in bids on disruptive technology when it comes to aviation. They're incredibly keen to learn about the R&D work that we do back home. We want to work closer with UK firms. Um, a huge amount of interest in our hydrogen projects. They've been looking at a lot of the policy work that we do when it comes to um, transport, in particular maritime, and they've been replicating that work here, but they want to work closer with UK firms in delivering their sort of zero emission transport or digitalization of a lot of this uh, port infrastructure and no doubt a- aviation as well. So it encompasses it all, to be honest. Um, the exciting thing is that the, they really are keen to do more work with us. And we're, of course, incredibly keen to do more 
work with them too. I know we've been talking about aviation, but I wanted to also ask you about electric vehicle tariffs. It's on the, I've spotted on the agenda, but on the trade committee between the EU and the UK, that this issue of um, the tariffs on EVs and the TCA is, is coming up on the agenda for the f- very first time on Wednesday. But, yeah. I wanted to talk to you about electric vehicles as well, because I've spotted today on the agenda on the trade committee between the EU and the UK, this issue of um, the tariffs on electric vehicles in the TCA is on the agenda for the very first time on Wednesday. And I wanted to ask you, I know this has been something you've spoken at the dispatch box a lot. Is this the first time the UK is going to formally request a delay to that TCA cliff edge? I think it, it's been it's on the record that my Secretary of State um, has been raising this issue with her counterparts in, in, in Brussels, and and it's no secret that the uh, the largest umbrella body for the automotive sector, the SMMT, has been not only been making sound as a representation, but so as their sister body, if I can call it their sister body, that represents um, countries within the EU, which have hard hard. Um, quite deep manufacturing basis when it comes to the automotive sector, in Germany in particular. So representation has been made and continue to be made because we know the deadline is coming up. But I am optimistic that you know that the, the right decision will be taken, mostly because of the decision that, um, that Brussels took, forgive me, I think it was a few weeks ago when Ursula von der Leyen um, opened up a consultation, I'm not sure how you'd reference it, to, to see how the impact of cheaper Chinese imports into the, um, the EU market. So this is an issue that's of far more significance than you would believe um, within the EU. And don't forget that EU car manufacturers import more into the UK than we export into the EU. So yeah. it will impact those cars much more than, than we would be led to believe if you read some of the UK press. Um, I wanted to ask then also about your advanced manufacturing plan that I know your Secretary of State has promised to unveil in the autumn. What What is that likely to include? Is it more aimed at regulation and supply chains? Is it going to be supported by a package of subsidies and tax credits? So the advanced manufacturing plan that we have been speaking about is about supporting um, all supporting our industry sectors and ensuring that they can be as competitive as they can. Um, it's, it's interesting being here in 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 seattle and obviously a lot of conversation is taking place business talk about ira for example we're never going to have as deep pockets as the americans when it comes to ira we don't want to be involved in a subsidy race either but we know where our expertise lies for each of our advanced manufacturing sectors and it's about providing them the support security and the certainty in the long term that they need to make sure that they can continue to invest um, in, in the UK. And to back up the advanced manufacturing plan, we've done two very critical pieces of work. One is looking at supply chains, and I'll be publishing an import supply chain strategy in the autumn. And the second is I've already refreshed a critical mineral strategy to reflect some of the geopolitical tensions to make sure that advanced manufacturers can get hold of the basic products and minerals that they need to continue manufacturing. So that was Industry Minister Nurse Ghani speaking to Bloomberg, trying to put the positive case for the government in terms of getting trade deals, albeit with you know, state-to-state trade deals rather than US, UK overall ones. Businesses are really watching, though, of course, all of this political jousting over policy that's taking place now and during conference season with increasing concern about what could be a long election campaign. Also, you've got the autumn statement. Ahead of that, the Confederation of British industry is calling on the government to focus on measures which will boost business investment. And we've been talking about that to the CBI's chief economist, Louise Hellam. We were really pleased to see back at the spring budget that the Chancellor heard our call around having a full expensing regime to take over from the super deduction and really make sure we are incentivising capital investment in the UK. But that's only a three year measure. And actually, businesses now are planning for the longer term. They need to have certainty about the tax regime going forward. So if the Chancellor commits to uh, full expensing being made permanent in the autumn. We think it can have a real boost to investment, maybe increasing it by up to 20% by 2030. But there's so much uncertainty. What is the cost to business of the government rolling back on its green policies? So many businesses that I've spoke to over the last few days um, since we had those announcements have found that 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 measure has created a lot of uncertainty for them, especially because 
many of the businesses that I speak to are really committed to the net zero journey. I think if you look under some of the detail of what the Prime Minister said, there is some positive. So one of the big things that we've been hearing from businesses that they need, and we've been talking to the, the Treasury about over the summer, is around grid connectivity. And there actually was a commitment uh, to speed up that process within the announcement. But it's without a doubt has definitely cast out on the overall UK as commitment to net zero. We've also been talking a lot about the debate over HS2. We were speaking to the project's former chairman, Alan Cook, yesterday. He said cutting HS2 would be an error of judgment and that the inconsistency of the government around this policy is damaging Britain's reputation. Do you agree? So again, I think particularly for um, our businesses in, in the north of the UK, HS2 is just so important. I think that poor transport connectivity obviously is a drag on investment and productivity and, and it, if it is confirmed that we're rolling back on that, that would definitely further damage investor confidence in the UK. Okay, the CBI as, the, as a lobby group you know, supports the green energy transition, supports HS2, supports more migration into the UK. I mean, those issues are things that the Conservative Party seems to actually not want to do. Does the Conservative Party resemble the party of business that they once were? I think we're um, keen to obviously work with all political parties. I think the important thing at the moment, especially as we go into a general election year, is thinking about where we can have cross-party consensus on some of the really big issues. And I think think the issues around net zero are long term and so we need to have that shared vision even if you have a healthy debate about the different policies that sit within that. Uh, one of the big things that we need to see as well is that consistency around tax and one of the things that we did earlier in the summer is produce a tax roadmap where it's some of those high level principles we want to see from both political parties around certainty, simplicity, proportionality and importantly international competitiveness as well. What's the risk to business from an acrimonious election campaign where policies are going to essentially be ripped up? And I mean, we're looking essentially at a year of almost policy stasis. Nothing big can be done between now and the next election. I think, like I say, it is really important as much as possible to, to see where we can have that, that cross-party consensus. I think the UK obviously does face quite a lot of challenges at the moment and key to a lot of the issues that we've been talking about is stimulating business investment. And increasingly, as I speak to businesses, particularly those multinationals who perhaps have offices in different parts of the world, it is becoming increasingly hard for them to attract investment to the UK. So actually, we need to think about that bigger picture and cut through some of that political rhetoric as, as difficult as I know that can be. That was Louise Hellam who's Chief Economist at the Confederation of British Industry speaking to us a little bit earlier. So I think reflecting the concern that a lot of businesses really have right now given the kind of stagflationary tendencies in the UK, the lack of growth, the pressure from inflation and the worry that maybe there won't be much concrete action from a government if you know we, we're going to spend the next 18 months really in campaigning mode yeah certainly in the political world there's already a lot of talk about the next general election isn't it even though it may be 12 14 perhaps 15 months away but uh, yes it's already on people's radars that's it from us for today if you like the program don't forget to subscribe and give it five stars so that other people can find it on apple Podcasts, spotify or wherever you listen this episode was produced by james walcock and our audio engineer was mariful hussein i'm ewan potts and i'm caroline hepker we'll be back with more tomorrow this is bloomberg bloomberg uk politics listen weekdays at noon on dab digital radio in london 